There's been a lot of questions surrounding CWD, so a couple of weeks ago we sat down with Chad Stewart to ask him about the future of deer hunting with CWD and also to ask him a few questions directly from our viewers. Well, hey everybody, we are here down in Lansing. We're here with Chad Stewart, kind of the big game specialist for the DNR. We're here a couple hours before the NRC meets in this very room. And we want to sit down with Chad and just talk deer, uh, specifically CWD. And before we kind of get into some of the questions that you, the viewers, have asked us to ask you, just give me a snapshot over the last couple of years. How long have we been dealing with chronic wasting disease? Why is it a big deal? Or is it a big deal? So the, the DNR thinks it's a big deal. Um, we first identified chronic wasting disease in a captive facility back in 2008 in okay. northeastern Kent County. Um, our first free-ranging deer came in 2015, um, that spring, and we've been identifying positive animals since then. And as we've identified new positives and new locations and different numbers of positive animals, our response has changed accordingly based on our knowledge base. Um, so we've been at this now for going on four years, um, knowing that CWD has been in our free ranging deer. Okay. And what are you doing in those areas where you have found deer? I know there's the core zone, the management zone, kind of explain a little bit about what are you doing there? So it's obviously evolved over time. Um, so when you first find a positive animal in a location, one of the priorities is to understand what you're dealing with. So the goal primarily shifts to, to surveillance, understanding what you're, you're dealing with. And with CWD, um, unfortunately, there's no effective live test. There, there is a live test, um, but the most effective way to determine whether or not a deer has chronic wasting disease or not is post-mortem, so after the animal's died. Um, so we work a lot with uh, hunters and create regulations so we can test a lot of deer to determine what we're dealing with. And then after that, we try to focus on the core area that's affected or the, the known area that's affected and try to remove as many positive animals from that location as possible. Um, and, and we've used that decision because um, some other states have been fairly effective at at least limiting or slowing the spread of the disease using that approach. And when you talk about the disease, do we know for sure how it is transmitted between animals? So the prions have been identified in saliva, in urine, in feces, uh, it's been in blood, it's actually been in skeletal muscle. So everything that we have data-wise supports that the disease can be spread directly from deer to deer. Um, deer are obviously social animals, they, they live in social groups. Um, but this prion can persist in the environment as well for a long time um, and it's fairly stable and, and can actually be binding to soil particles and taken up by plant tissue and it can persist there for years as well. So we do have a, a better understanding of how it can be transmitted. Um, we're still trying to understand the, the infection cycle and how that works. So we don't know if one deer is exposed to one prion, if that animal will get sick or contract the disease, or if it takes multiple repeated exposures over time. So we're still trying to understand the dynamics around the transmission, but we have a pretty good understanding that of how it's being transmitted. And if a deer has CWD, and correct me if I'm wrong, from some of the stuff that I've read and just as people read stuff or see stuff online or on different television shows, um, can it, I don't want to say this, how long, so a deer could have chronic wasting disease and not show any signs for up to? On average, it's about a year and a half to two years. So between actually contracting the disease and showing symptoms of the disease, it's on average about a year and a half to two years. It can take longer in some cases. There's been some studies that shows just different genetic makeups can actually um, prolong the, that incubation cycle. Not necessarily a, might not necessarily be a good thing, actually, when you think that these animals uh, that are not showing symptoms are continuing depositing prions in the environment and contributing to that environmental load. Um, so it sounds good, but we don't know if it is good. Um, but on average, it's about a year and a half to two years before they show those symptoms. Okay. So what we did recently, and I know we had been communicating before we got here, we put a thing out on our Facebook page just saying, hey, we're going to sit down with the DNR. Um, give you a chance to kind of ask us to ask you some questions 
Um, and one of the things that came, obviously a big part of the regulation change was the baiting issue sure, sure. Uh, that is now banned going forward, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so let me bring in a couple of the questions here. Um, and uh, Brandon Decker wanted to know why doesn't the public have a say in the baiting ban? Um, so the the uh, the baiting ban actually went through um, our our Natural Resource Commission, which is open to public comment. So that was open for several months uh, last year. So the public certainly had an opportunity to provide input throughout our public in engagement process. Um, so there was an opportunity to do that okay. um, for several months. Uh, and obviously, once the decision is made, it's 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 been made. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in the coming months, and, and certainly people will continue to express their opinions on it. But all of our regulation changes are open for public comment. Okay. Um, and I think one of the big things was maybe folks can make the leap of, okay, I can see ban banning baiting in the counties where it's been found, but why, why make it statewide? Why make it all the northern lower in counties that are far removed from any CWD deer? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an important distinction. The baiting ban goes into effect uh, January 31st, and it's for the lower peninsula. So we, we've not passed any regulations uh, for the upper peninsula. So it's not a true statewide ban uh, as, it, as it exists today. Um, and it's a great point. Um, and I think it's just the way that we're viewing it versus maybe the way others are viewing it. So we're viewing CWD as a really important disease in terms of the future management of white-tailed deer and even elk and, and moose in our, in our state. Um, so with that, identifying it as, a, in a, as an important piece of, of our future management, we wanted to take a proactive approach. We don't have enough surveillance history throughout the entire state to make the determination whether CWD exists or not. So just because we haven't identified it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm -hmm. So we feel that in a and a proactive uh, response, it's, it's, it makes sense to do this. Um, even, will, even if though those counties, with those folks not being able to bait, you're going to be shooting less deer, most likely. Well, we don't know that. And certainly, if that's the results that we start seeing, um, I think we need to revisit it. Okay. But I'm, I'm not confident yet in saying that that's going to be the actual response. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that we will definitely monitor. And if if we find out that our regulation is proving counterproductive to what our management goals are, I think we absolutely need to revisit it. Okay. But I'm not so that's confident. on the table that that could change as new information comes Regulations in. Regulations change all the time, yeah. So as it stands right now, I don't know if there's any discussions on changing it right away, but we want to we wanna see what happens with it. And we have identified this as a risk. So okay. the, the analogy that, that makes sense to me is if you have a family member that lives in your house and they come down with the cold, or the flu, um, there's still a really good chance that you're going to get sick too because you're living in close proximity with that individual. But that doesn't mean you assume added risk. You're not drinking out of the straw after they're sick. You're not finishing their mashed potatoes that they leave on the plate. Um, and so where this is really a risk mitigation approach that we're talking about. And I understand that some people view this as an overreach. Um, yeah. and that, that's that's their view, and it's that's a that's a completely adequate view of it. We feel that it's more of a proactive approach okay. in trying to limit the spread of the disease where we don't know it may exist. And there is a fair amount of uh, discussion out there that CWD doesn't really kill very many deer. So versus what we have been doing. So can you, and I'm trying to think of where this question is here, but uh, oh, Justin McDonald wants to know how many deer have died in Michigan from chronic wasting disease? Yeah, it's a good question. It's one we've been getting a lot lately. Um, I would say that it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because um, one, CWD doesn't necessarily kill the deer. It's usually complications associated with CWD that kill the deer. So most deer that have CWD and have shown those symptoms and die, they have something like pneumonia or they have something else that is killing them. But that doesn't mean that CWD is contributing to the death of the individual. It's like how um, people don't necessarily die from AIDS. They die from complications from AIDS, but those complications wouldn't exist if AIDS didn't exist. Okay. So with that being said, um, we've identified two animals that have been symptomatic with the disease in our state so far. One was our initial case in Ingham County that first detection in free-ranging deer. She was symptomatic. She was an older doe. She was less than 100 pounds. 
um, clearly had cognitive issues um, and was put down by an officer, okay. um, clearly visibly sick. The other what came from a landowner that reported a visibly sick deer in Jackson County. This was the first deer identified in Jackson County last summer. Uh, went out the next day and that animal had passed away. Um, but the necropsy, the cause of death is technically pneumonia. She has pneumonia in July, okay. but she's full-blown chronic wasting disease. So would you say conservatively, though, I mean, would you say thousands of deer, 10 deer, 50 deer? I mean, I'd heard the number in the 50s of so, deer that have died that, that we know of from chronic wasting disease. Is that wrong or right? So the number of deer that have tested positive for CWD is over 100 now. I think we're over 110 over our four-year period. Okay. Um, two of them have been symptomatic. That's not to say that if a hunter hadn't harvested those deer that they eventually wouldn't turn symptomatic and die from the disease. Um, they were just harvested before that symptom manifested itself. So I'd also say that that's also a short-term view to a long-term problem. So looking at how many deer are dying or symptomatic from the disease today doesn't necessarily translate to what it will look like in 20, 30, 40 years. Because certainly if you go to states that, are, that have been dealing with this for on a much longer timeline than we have, they're seeing more deer that have chronic wasting disease. They're finding more deer that have died from chronic wasting disease or complications from chronic wasting disease. So that's a point we don't want to get to, and that's why we're trying to take some active approaches and stances today to prevent it from getting to that point. And I think from the other side of that coin, they're saying, okay, if we've seen 100 deer this year, let's say next year it's 200 deer. You know, I did a little research, which I'm not usually known to do uh, before getting here, but we kill anywhere between 40 and 50,000 deer per year with cars. That comes down to like 120 to 130 a day from cars. Mm -hmm. And if chronic wasting disease is only going to maybe take out 50 to 100 per year, aren't we going way overboard to say, we got to ban baiting, we got to kill all these deer down in southern Michigan, south. It just seems like, like you said, for a lot of people, it's, we're overreaching. Do you see where they're coming from, or do you still feel that even if we're only taking out 100 deer a year from CWD, it's worth doing all these. Yeah, so I, I do see where they're coming from, looking at the data here and now. Uh, so part of our responsibility as an agency is to ensure the future sustainability and health of our wildlife resource. And what we do is we look at places that have been dealing with this on a timeline much longer than ours to see if we can predict what's going to happen. And when you look at places like southern Wisconsin, the farmland area that's been dealing with it since 2002 and probably realistically much, much earlier before that, um, you're finding one out of every five animals in that area affected with the disease. Hmm. And they're starting to see, they've got some active research going on now that CWD, uh, animals that have CWD are dying at three times a higher rate than animals without CWD. So these are things, and CWD, because it's ability to stay in the environment, you can't reset the clock. This is not like hemorrhagic disease, which is the viral disease that kills a lot of deer in a very short amount of time in, uh, in the fall. That's devastating to deer populations in a very quick, fast amount of time, but the deer herd recover because it's a virus and that can't persist in the environment over time. Prions can persist in the environment over time. So what happens is you get this snowball effect more and more animals become exposed, more and more animals become infected with it, okay. and it is a fatal disease. That's, that's the fear, that's, so the DNR is operating on, we're looking 30 years, 40 years down the road, not this year and next year. Correct, yeah, if, if you could, if, if research showed that CWD was present in 1% or half of a percent of our deer, and it stayed at that level, and it was just, endemic in all of our deer and it didn't have any human health issues, which currently is not known to have, but we don't, there's still emerging research on that. If it just stayed at that, we wouldn't be having a conversation about chronic wasting disease. It's, it's what the disease looks like in decades from now. It's not what it looks like today. So you mentioned what other states are doing. So Kenneth Ritt, Rutz here wanted to know, why are you following the same example as other states yet expecting different results? or are we doing the same thing as other states? I'm not sure that we are doing the same thing as other states. So 
one of the, and, and maybe what Kenneth is referring to is, you know, trying to increase the harvest of, of deer, trying to, trying to kill more deer. Some of that is for testing purposes because we want to know and, and try to map out where the disease exists. But we're also on a different timeline from a lot of people too. So we get compared to Wisconsin a lot. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a just um, comparison. I mean, we're both Midwestern, North Central states, um, rich hunting tradition. Um, high, uh, high number of deer in their southern uh, parts of their states, you know, much more forested in their northern parts, um, very similar. When Wisconsin first started finding CWD in 2002, that first year, they found over 200 positive animals. So their timeline was far more accelerated than what, what we've been dealing with. Um, and they, they've contributed a tremendous amount of knowledge to the overall body of research for CWD. But overall, um, the disease has continued to escalate in that, in that state. It's spread, and then where it's been first identified locally, it's increased. So we haven't tried quite the same approach that they have. Um, we're focusing more on management, where they focused initially on eradication. That's not our goal. We don't want to eradicate deer. We know that they're a valued resource. That's why we're... Well, that's a lot of people. They just want to kill off all the deer. And I think any reasonable person would say, why would, why would the department want to kill off all the deer? Now you did, we did see an influx in, you know, antlerless tags that you could get in certain parts of the state. Um, why did you guys remove the antler restrictions in those areas as well? Yeah, so the antler restrictions were removed um, because we want to make deer available for hunters to, to harvest. So we know that um, the likelihood of people harvesting two deer is probably pretty small. Um, but um, that, that four point restriction on the, on the combo license, doing away with that, opens up more deer for harvest um, once that first deer is harvested or once. But, and you guys got a lot of blowback from that, right? We did, we did. And was it worth, do you think it was worth it? I don't know, I don't know. We'll, we're gonna look at the data that comes out of it this year. And if, if in any way it sacrificed our ability to manage deer or, or um, proves counterproductive in managing for the disease, um, I think we need to present that data and see if it makes a, if, if it did have an impact. But we're, we're so early in the process after our deer season ended right now that we haven't had a time to evaluate that yet. A couple more questions for you. How much money does the DNR get from insurance companies? Zero that I'm aware of. Okay. I haven't seen any of it. I can tell you that. No. Um, I mean, that's a, that is a common... I, I don't want to say myth because I, I, I don't I can't look at your books or whatever but f from you standing here as representing the DNR you're saying that they do not get any money from because everybody you know when we look at our thousand responses that we got on this it was like ah the insurance companies are in charge of everything and so your response to that is I, I've I've been managing deer in two states for 12 years and I have had a grand total of zero conversations with anybody with uh, what this rumor would be associated with the insurance side of things now I I don't expect people to believe me, um, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't. Well, this one I thought was kind of an interesting. Uh, this is uh, Jim Peck uh, asked this. He says, it's been 20 years in the Northeast Lower Peninsula that we have had TB. Why should we trust the DNR in getting rid of CWD if we can't even get rid of TB? What have we learned from that? Is that, what do you, what do you Yeah, respond? and that's, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll, I will point out some of the history with TB that when we first started finding it, in, in the mid 1990s, we were finding it at fairly high percentages, like three, four, five percent of our deer. And within short order, we had knocked that down to below two percent. And at some point, I think it even dipped below one percent. Hmm. So some of our early management actions actually did um, help. Um, Do you feel it's contained? Like, are you guys happy with where it's at as far as the percentage of deer? Or? You're never happy with where it's at with TB because that, first of all, TB is a bacteria. There, there's legitimately, you can eradicate deer, I, I'm sorry, eradicate the disease um, of TB by, by removing enough deer. Um, you can get those positive, because that's a density dependent disease. Um, okay. We haven't had the capacity to get the deer herd low enough to get rid of the disease. And that's one of the challenges that we've been faced with up there. So we're trying some different approaches up there and working collaborati collaboratively with some landowners and trying to focus on those hot spots and try to remove the positive animals from the, the, the population 
um, without having an overall impact. And what do you say, and I'm not sure what you can, but I'll ask it anyways, to those, I've been up there, we spent a lot of time in that part of the state as we do a lot of the parts of the state, and I've been in bars and restaurants and hotels that are saying, would you please tell people to come back up here because we still have huntable deer population, but it, the population is so low that those businesses, those restaurants, all the different things, they're, they have really taken a sustained hit because of management practices in that part of the state. What do you say to those folks? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's why there's so many eyes on the deer program right now in Michigan. Um, and that's why these diseases are really important because we don't want that to continue escalating throughout the state, you know, and having challenges with our deer herd that we can't reverse. So that's why we're taking some different approaches. We're working with landowners up there. Um, I think that what they tried maybe 20 years ago had an impact. It just didn't have the staying power to, to, to sustain that impact. And, and, and our approach hasn't necessarily evolved over time. Um, we're, we're trying some new interesting things up there and I think that there's um, some promise with that. But we'll, time will tell as anything else. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, a couple more questions here before we let you go. Adam Lewis wants to know, when will we have mandatory reporting of harvests either online or on the phone like so many other states have? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and, and I will say that it, within a couple years, I can see that actually happening. Um, I really do. Do I think it's necessary to manage our deer herd? No, I don't. Um, because we send out a survey every year that gives us a confidence uh, interval around an estimate whether it's a countywide estimate or a statewide estimate, we have a, we have a confidence interval around that. And what does that mean what is, to Joe Blow when you're like, yeah. well, how can you send out a survey and yeah. expect to know the same as people calling in? Yeah, it's, it's just like doing a survey at your, at your local church function and ask people um, what time they ate dinner and, and trying to get an estimate. You only have to ask so many people um, before you get a really good idea that when most people eat dinner type thing. It's, it's, it's all based on uh, a survey and statistics. You don't have to ask everybody the same question. Mm. Um, you only have to ask a few to paint the whole picture, given that, that there's what we call a confidence interval, which is basically a plus or minus, you know, around that estimate. Um, that and you th feel that those numbers are pretty good even countywide or is it more region okay. countywide it gets a little bit broader because you're dealing with smaller sample size but once you start looking at sample sizes for the entire state we have a pretty good idea of total number of deer harvested um, total number of deer harvested within a region efforts we have really good estimates for any of that stuff when you go to a mandatory check approach um, what you're doing is getting a minimum count so everybody who's willing to report mm -hmm. can do that but we know that 100 percent of people will not report and the trick is to try to estimate how many people are not reporting. And so you feel the number of people that, so with the, the end number that you get, whether from survey or from manda mandatory call it in, you feel is pretty similar. We would continue our survey approach to correct for the mandatory piece. What's great about the mandatory piece is we would have a much better estimate on, on how many deer were taken right now, right as the hunting season concluded. Okay. Whereas currently it takes several months to, to churn through that statistic, statistical process to come up with an estimate. Um, I do think we know that hunters like this idea. They, they know, I think it gives, us, gives them a little bit more confidence that we're actually tallying things. Okay. And we've gone through some recent licensed vendor changes that uh, we can now incorporate that into our system. So I think those discussions are happening, they're ongoing. I wouldn't be surprised within a couple years that that does come up. But again, I don't think it's necessary. Um, we have a really good system in place right now, and we're going to continue that system. It would just be for more of a timely um, response to what happened in the deer season. Uh, can you eat, uh, this is George Brannan wants to know, can you eat a deer with CWD? Can you eat it? Yes. Is it advised to eat it? No. Um, so we are wildlife professionals. I'm a wildlife biologist. I'm not a public health person. Mm -hmm. Um, so we tend to rely on uh, the recommendations from people with public health backgrounds. Um, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, they recommend that if your animal has chronic wasting disease that you do not consume that animal. But we know that there's never been a documented case of someone eating an infected deer and contra contracting the Correct. human version of that disease. Correct. There's no individual cases of it. They've looked at population level impacts at like Wyoming where CWD is much higher than anywhere else in the country. Yeah. 
and there's no higher case of human incidences of uh, what's, what would be a, what called a variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, um, it doesn't appear to have a defined link. That being said, we don't know if there truly is one. We don't know what the future would hold. Um, and this is in the same family or category of diseases as mad cow disease. So it's not the same, but it's very close. Well, so, I think that's the fear that is getting yeah. being perpetuated out there is that, well, if you don't get your deer checked, you shouldn't eat it. And that's having a lot, I mean, I've talked to a lot of hunters that have said, well, my wife's not gonna eat the deer because I didn't get it tested. Yeah. But it is, we have no case where that has proven to be a problem. That's correct, okay. yeah. Okay, and last question for you. This one comes from a Ted Nugent. He's a guitar player here in the state of Michigan. Yes, he says that Buicks kill more deer than CWD. The DNR can't be trusted. There's only 58 deer in Michigan that have died from CWD, but the DNR has slaughtered thousands. Who, who is the enemy of the deer hunter? And you would say to that. <laughs> so a lot of our testing is based on what's structured around our hunting season. So it's, uh, we do engage with sharpshooting around a very localized, confined area. You're talking about maybe hundreds of deer over the course of several years okay. across the entire state that's tested for CWD. It's not a lot. Um, most of the deer that are being tested are coming from animals that are going to be harvested anyway by hunters. So we're relying on hunters for support for our surveillance and management programs. So these deer are getting managed by the, the hunters that are pulling the strings or the triggers already. Um, it's, it's true, there are, I don't know how many Buicks are on the road, but there are more car deer, deer accidents, accidents yeah. than animals for, that have tested for CWD. And I would say to that, you know, the car deer accidents are going to continue in Michigan for the foreseeable future. As long as there's deer or cars, that's gonna be a trend that's gonna continue. CWD tends to escalate over time. Okay. And that's something that we feel that we have a little bit more control over or want more control over. And that's why we're trying to feel like this is an important uh, topic that we need to, to focus on. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, just so I can kind of get, a, get my sure. head around it. So we feel, or the DNR feels, that even though currently chronic wasting disease is not affecting that many deer, not killing that many deer, that the baiting ban, the shooting extra deer, the different measures that you put in place is worth the public uh, outcry because of the potential harm down the road. Correct, yeah, we're, we always have our eye on the future. Um, so even, even in our current year, it's not necessarily what is happening this year, it's what are the impacts or implications down the road. And that's what we're constantly looking forward to. So yeah, if it can stay at the current level where it's at, I don't think we're having this discussion, but the data from other states shows that it doesn't stay at that at level. So. Well, I appreciate your time. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but we got to quite a few. So thank you to all that sent. Uh, people are going to be mad at me because I didn't ask their question, and people are going to be mad at you because of maybe how you answered or didn't answer. But I sure appreciate your time. Thanks, so Jimmy. thanks, Dad.